Okay. <coughs> so I think uh, uh, I think we can start. We can start uh, the lecture of uh, the third lecture of uh, Tanya Sharpie on hyperbolic geometry and information maximization neural circuits. Mm. So thank you, Matteo. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, can we start the recording? Okay. Very good. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> so, um, as a um, as a reminder, we covered so far entropy and axiomatics um, for Shannon entropy. And last lecture, we started talking about maximal informative nonlinearities, primarily in neural circuits. So we discussed. Can a neuron transmit one, more than one bit of information? And today um, I will discuss um, actually the different limits, the impact of noise. Um, we will talk about entropy and information for a Gaussian variable. But before that, the weak noise limit for estimation of information. And a very important result um, from uh, Simon Laughlin about um, that the cumul the importance of cum that the nonlinearity should be a cumulative distribution, and it is um, actually applied uh, has many applications and has uh, many names because it was rediscovered in different um, subfields of physics, and um, so then a few uh, applications of this result. And after this, so, so far, this will be information transmission by a single on-off um, channel as a neuron. And then we will discuss information transmission by multiple neurons in the presence of noise and um, um, talk about how this leads to a, a theory of uh, diversification in biology. So that's the plan for today. So um, I would say, let's um, ask about, so we have one neuron, one on-off device, and it has a nonlinearity. And we would like to ask, what is that optimal nonlinearity? And there is a different answers depending on the amount of noise and um, um, various the parameters of the input distribution. So um, also the question of optimal, many people define optimal in different ways. So for the purpose of um, today's discussion, we will say optimal is the one that maximizes information transmission. But the, um, often the, the nonlinearities are similar uh, optimal nonlinearity is similar whether we are maximizing information transmission or minimal decoding error or other measures. <laughs> so um, the first uh, derivation says, suppose noise is very small. Then um, um, as we know, as we discussed, information is the entropy of the neuronal response minus the entropy conditional um, of the neuron for a given stimulus. But if that is much smaller to a first approximation, information is just entropy. So we are maximizing response entropy of the neuron. And um, it has this expression. So it can be written as an integral or the sum over the states, but um, if in the limit of um, smoothly graded responses, we have this integral P of Y log P of Y. So we would like to find um, what non, so the, the distribution of um, neuronal responses will be affected by its nonlinearity. So the signal is fixed and the signal distribution is fixed, but when we choose different nonlinearities, we will get a different um, resulting probability um, of the response. 
and our goal is to maximize it. So, and then when we maximize, we have a constraint that the probability distribution has to equal to one. And it's just a general property of all probability distributions. So we use the method of uh, Lagrange multipliers. And um, so that's our um, optimization uh, function. So we are trying to maximize this under a given constraint that the integral p of um, y dy is equal to one. So when we try to optimize, so with respect to vari uh, variation in uh, Um, in uh, P, so we will have um, log P of Y. And then when we try to vary this part, we get P of Y over P of Y times delta P of Y. So we get minus one. And then um, the, the derivative with respect to this term is just minus lambda. So what we get is that basically P of Y is equal to a constant. So I think this is um, um, an, an important result. It says, well, we know that entropy is maximal for uniform distributions, but if, um, um, in other words, to restate what, um, uh, because the question is what is the optimal nonlinearity, the optimal nonlinearity will be the one such that all output states are equally likely. And uh, if, if you think it, it, it makes intuitive sense that if a neuron has, um, say, four different response levels, then all of these response levels have to be used equally. Otherwise, we are not using them um, effectively. I hope that. Um, yeah, maybe uh, Tanya, may, can I yes. make a, yes. a plot? So the idea is that you have a stimulus, then uh, this goes through a certain function, and then uh, you have uh, y, right? And yes. uh, and essentially, uh, what you want to minimize, maximize, is the mutual information, which is the entropy of the output minus the entropy of the output given the input. Now we are working in the case where this is zero, right? Where there is no noise. Yes. Okay. And so the question is, uh, uh, so when we maximize this, we find that uh, uh, the P of Y, so the P of Y should be essentially a constant. So essentially, if, uh, if this uh, f of y, if here you have x and here you have the output, then this function uh, may be something like this. So. OK. Yes. And then the idea is that uh, you, uh, so the, the function should be such that uh, if you have a distribution over x, when you uh, convolute this distribution with f of x, uh, this is f of x, uh, then uh, you should get a uniform distribution, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so you know, I'm just restating that entropy is maximal for uniform distributions. And um, so then this is the nonlinearity, so that Matea wrote, so consider nonlinear transformation, y equals uh, in my slides g, but in principle f. Um, and now um, we can derive the form for this distribution using um, the following property. I, I find it very useful property whenever um, you work with probability distributions. So if um, y is uniquely determined by x because there is no noise, then p of y dy equals to p of x dx. So if I am in a certain intervals of x with some probability, then this will be the weight for me to get to, into the corresponding bin 
dy with the weight p1. Um, um, very useful property for many, um, for generating various um, random numbers with various properties. But now our goal is to have p of y to be a constant. So instead of p of y, we write a constant. And, and so um, if you rewrite this, then we have dy over dx equals to some other constant times p of x. Or in other words, we have that y is equal to dx p of x. So, yeah, so maybe we can write that down. So y should be a constant times the integral, say, from minus infinity to x. So this is uh, y is equal to g of x. Yes. Integral between minus infinity and x, dx prime of p of x prime. Yes. Thank you, Michael. So in other words, Nonlinearity has to be a cumulative distribution of, of inputs in order to maximize information. And in this way, um, if um, whatever that probability distribution is on the x-axis, as a result of this transformation, you will have a uniform use um, of uh, the the responses. So we have a question in the chat. All right. So <clears throat> we had a question, uh, a useful question. So why are we talking about nonlinearities and why are we introducing nonlinearities? So the neuron, uh, because it is. Um, um, an on-off device, so it has, it cannot, um, in, in not just in neuroscience, but in, in many areas of biology, if you have um, the signal, such as the number of spikes that the neuron produces, it cannot be negative. And it also cannot be infinite, because each uh, neuron has, there is a maximum rate with which it can respond. Um, for example, uh, I will draw a little bit of... Um, <clears throat> so as a side note, so this is um, how the neuron... I thought... No, not that. Um, I'm trying to draw a spike. Uh, so, Um, the, the spike has, uh, as a function of time, if this is time, then this, the neuron is just the basic property of neuron transmission, and this is voltage, it will have this shape. Um, some say that, um, um, so in other words, so ba basically in a neuron, uh, it is a voltage sensitive cell. It's not, um, so to produce a spike in the voltage, it has to uh, open some um, channels. So there are holes in the membrane, but they're not just always open. They're mostly closed to let um, for various ions, but then they have to open. And the one sort of ions flows through, and then another set of ions flows out. And then the pores close, and that's the end of the spike. So while this is happening, it, it, it cannot produce another spike. So there is a minimum time that it takes to produce a spike and to recover from it. 
So the neuron cannot produce um, um, spikes at an infinite rate. So the typical, the maximum firing rate, it depends on the neuron, but is not larger than one kilohertz. But from a theoretical perspective, if I think of a neuron as um, producing some firing rate as a function of the input X, then um, the X can go between minus infinity and plus infinity in principle. But the firing rate, it has to be zero at some point, and it has to saturate at some level just by the basic construction. So the neural responses have to be, um, have to include nonlinearity. So the question is, what is that form of the nonlinearity? So the parameters that are adjustable and which differ depending on the neuron is where to put a threshold. That's one parameter that you can adjust. You can also adjust the, uh, the width of this transition region, which sometimes I call neuronal noise. We'll talk about that. And then um, there are more complicated neurons. And uh, in principle, one can also encounter nonlinearities that go up and, and go down. And uh, so the theoretical question is, um, if we want to understand the nervous system, why some neurons um, choose to operate with one nonlinearity and other neurons choose to operate with a different nonlinearity. Okay, so. Okay, uh, do so, we know P of X a priori? Yes, so that's um, another important question. So, P of X is. Um, not known up, um, to some extent is known and it's, to some extent it is changing so in um, um, i will um, let me see if i can find so the reason um but in any case i think it can be learned right from uh past history. So the neuron yes. can adapt uh, to, can learn what the it, P of X is. Exactly. So what I was going to say is that um, because P of X is important and we see that it determines the optimal probability distribution, people study and kind of in, in the next few examples, what is a typical P of X for the natural world. And uh, um, there are certain, there are many regularities and there is a substantial body of work which says, uh, given the statistics of signals in the natural world, here are the um, neural response properties that we expect to find. So one particular, uh, but as um, Matteo mentioned, this uh, P of X is not a constant function because um, for example, you can uh, leave, um, f go from the outside where the light intensity is very high to inside the room where light intensity is low. So for a neuron that is in the retina, its inputs are directly changing and so the neuron has to adapt. And the reason it has to adapt, meaning um, that it will no longer be efficient. In other words, when P of X changes, the nonlinearity has to change according to this prescription. And in particular, for example, the threshold has to change. So there is, um, um, you know, some, some of the slides that um, um, I didn't quite prepare for this lecture, but I have um, uh, available. 
is um, talk about understanding uh, um, adaptation using these principles, because once the input distribution changes, this nonlinearity has to change. And then there is um, another question is, uh, how soon can the animal detect that there has been a change in the probability distribution? And that's a statistical question. And there are very interesting uh, um, differences. For example, if, uh, um, so let me show you an example of, um, um, of nonlinearity that I prepared and then we will, um, I'll check also, there is another comment in the... Oh, it's just, um, uh... okay. So I will talk about, um, unfortunately, I, I got out of this, um, I don't know how to <laughs> get back to... Um, so this is an example of analysis. Um, so I told you that this is the Simon Laughlin result, but then there are other people who have done it. So he looked at the neuron in the fly brain. It's called um, large monopolar cell. And um, he, uh, following up with this argument that nonlinearity, which is plotted here in black, the, the nonlinearity for this neuron. So he, he says response divided by the maximum response uh, as a function of the contrast of natural scenes. And then he says, well, I'm going to measure the light intensity in the natural world. And these are these error bars. So there is no fitting here. And uh, that's why this result is um, uh, considered a classic result in computational neuroscience, because uh, you put two things together that on the surface are completely unrelated. One is the light intensity in the natural world. The other one is a neuronal nonlinearity, and they match without any fitting. So, um, so that, that's that's one example. Um, and uh, so, I was going to talk about since we brought up the question of adaptation and statistical estimation. So, imagine that the contrast, which is plotted here we went from the uh, inside the room to the outside the room and the contrast increased. So it turns out that statistically it's easier to detect increases in the contrast than decreases in the con contrast. So for example, if, um, let's see, um, So if I have a sequence of signals with small contrast, and then all of a sudden I have large contrast. The moment I see large value, I know that it is extremely unlikely under my current model. So I know I have to change the model. On the other hand, if I go fr from large contrast to small contrast, when I see the small contrast, it is still consistent with a large amplitude deviation, probability distribution. And it's only after I see a number of samples, I will be able to say that the statistics have changed. So this in particular predicts that the time that it takes a neuron to adapt between the low contrast and the high contrast should be faster than the time that it takes the neuron to adapt from high contrast to low contrast. And that's indeed is true. So um, I, I'm just stating this, I, I, I do not have slides. Um, I can add them into this lecture notes, but um, this is the work by Michael DeVies and Adrian Fairhall and also Bill Balick, um, showing that the adaptation happens very fast, but it's nevertheless the adaptation from 
low to high variance is faster than high to low variance. And one can account for this um, due to the statistical estimation theory for how we update the parameters. Okay. Okay. So thank you for the questions. Any other questions? So one of the properties of um, natural scenes is that the, um, the distribution of signals is not Gaussian. So in this case, um, uh, it, it looks approximately Gaussian, but um, uh, for other variables, so not just light intensity, you can start seeing uh, um, larger fluctuations than what you would expect to find for a Gaussian signal. And so the nonlinearity should be uh, different from a cumulative uh, Gaussian distribution. Okay. So another um, example, um, it, it's a brief example, but um, I, I want to mention that because it relates to this question of probability distribution. So in this case, this is a picture that we will be uh, analyzing um, in a moment. So this is a, a, a picture of the expression level of a gene in a fruit fly embryo. And um, I, this is from the work by Bill Bialik and colleagues. So, and in general, if we think about transcription factor, you know, the differences between maximally informative transmission within a cell by a transcription factor or in the nervous system by neuron. In the case of the neuron, especially the sensory neuron, as we discussed, the probability distribution is usually set by the outside world, and the neuron has to adapt appropriately, choose the appropriate threshold, appropriate neural nonlinearity to achieve efficient coding. In the case of the cell, the how the transcription factor is activated can is often set by kind of by, by physics of molecular binding. But what the cell can control is the distribution of um, this transcript, uh, you know, the, the activating factor. So in that case, one can reverse the question and ask what is the optimal uh, input distribution of an intracellular signaling molecule for a given activation function. I hope yeah. that's okay. Yeah, so in other words, uh, in the case of transcription factors, so the, 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 the G is fixed by biochemistry. And then uh, uh, evolution adjusts, uh, I mean, what the organism can do is to adjust the probability distribution of uh, transcription factors arriving uh, to the right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now um, what we'll be analyzing is the more, so, so far this was an example, the derivation was um, maximum noise, um, uh, maximum response entropy. And uh, this was the case where noise was negligible. And we will slowly build up the case for uh, larger amounts of noise and how this is affected. Uh, before doing this, I will go through the case of a Gaussian noise and um, Gaussian variable. Yes, just a second. Okay, so um, no, this is not, uh, there, are, there are two Laughlins. This is not uh, Robert Laughlin, a fraction of quantum hall but Simon Laughlin, and um, he does a lot of work on uh, neuroscience and metabolic, um, 
metabolic effects in the nervous system. And uh, so now we will go over through. Um, okay, do, good noise. Uh, let's see. Uh, can I somehow go? I would like to go to full screen if possible. So this is the case, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, just this second. Mm -hmm. No, not this one. Not this one. Not this one. Okay. So we will discuss uh, first um, entropy of uh, a, a Gaussian um, Gaussian variable. And um, so this is the slides we discussed. And uh, talk about, it's useful to know um, if you are, um, if you're familiar with this, we can go faster, but this is a theorist uh, toolbox of uh, what is the entropy of a Gaussian variable. And we will apply it to a first linear case, even though we know that neurons are nonlinear. And um, then uh, um, evaluate this information transmission in the case where, like um, in this case here, um, assuming that noise here is Gaussian, and uh, so we will have a distribution over P of X, which is assumed uniform. And then um, we need to know the information that is conveyed by neural responses for a given value of X. And because we plot here error bars, we are approximating them as a Gaussian variable. This is kind of a maximum entropy approximation here. So the entropy of a Gaussian distribution. So it, did you, if you covered it in the course already, then we can go faster. We maybe just recall uh, uh, what, the, what the differential entropy of a Gaussian variable is. Yes, so this is a, a general definition of a Gaussian variable. So P of Z, where it's defined by the average, its average value. And here in the denominator, you have the variance of that variable. So if the variable has zero mean, then it will be e to the minus z squared over to sigma squared, where sigma squared is this variance. So now we want to compute the entropy of this distribution. Um, the expression for the entropy is uh, minus um, the integral over z, p of z log of p of z. And uh, in other words, it's an average because it's an integral over dz p of z. So it's an average of log to p of z. So now um, we start by evaluating because this is the function that of which we need to compute the average. We take the log. So we transform the log two as one over natural log, log two natural of two, then natural log, and then apply it to first the prefactor and then to the exponent itself. And uh, so this is a constant. So when we average this expression to get the entropy here, we will have the, because it's uh, log one over this times minus will be, um, so this is just the proportionality constant and this is log of the variance. So that's important because it says that the entropy of a 
Gaussian distribution, the broader the variance, the larger the entropy, which um, useful to remember and agrees with intuition. And then we have the average of this um, expression, which um, is uh, z, uh, z minus the average squared over the variance. But what this is, because this is the average of z minus the average squared, so this is just delta z squared. And uh, so rewriting this first part, and then this is cancels, and then we just get one half. So you get a very simple expression that the entropy of a Gaussian variable is um, um, one half log two, some constants like two pi e, and then the variance of the signal. So now a few comments about this expression. So it is useful, but beware that, we, we, I think we had uh, some, um, in, in reality, this integral is, um, is difficult to compute um, because, um, um, so, so this is just, just one answer, but in fact, there is an infinite term that we have omitted and relates to the delta Z. Because uh, if, the, if you can tell the signal to the infinite precision, then the entropy will be infinite. So, but for another property of this um, expression is that entropy is dependent of the mean signal for a Gaussian variable. But if you have a non-Gaussian signal, so you might have then dependence on the variance on the mean. So in that case, you will have a function that depends both on the mean and the variance. So now we are looking for information transmission um, for a Gaussian channel where um, for now we are forgetting about nonlinearity. So a, a linear system, why um, the response Y is linearly related to signal X. And we would like to characterize the information transmission in the presence of noise. So Tanya, we have a question from Gibbs. Okay. Uh, please, could you go back to the previous slide? Yes. Okay, I just have a question for some precision because when we saw the entropy for the continuous variable with uh, Matteo, it was like an additional term to make sure that the entropy is always positive. But in this case, I don't know what, what is the, okay, what is the range of the value of the average of delta z square? Because if it is very less than two pi e, the low could be negative. Yes. I don't know. Yes, so we have uh, um, the logarithm of delta z, um, the, the term that is uh, um, kind of uh, uh, our negative uh, in infinity is, uh, is omitted here. <laughs> so can I comment yes. on this? So, so this is, uh, strictly speaking, what is called a differential entropy. And then uh, when you measure Z to a precision delta, the entropy of the discretized variable should be this uh, minus log of delta. But log of delta is a constant. So as we are going to discuss the optimization problem of this channel, it does not really matter. Okay? Yes. So there is an infinity there because if, if delta is very small, then, um, <laughs> the, the, you know, that's right. Thank you. So uh, information transmission for a Gaussian channel. So we have y that is equal to linear function of x times a constant plus noise. And uh, how much does observations on Y provide about the signal X? 
because noise is Gaussian, we know that um, P of Y given X is um, this probability distribution, which is um, one over two pi variance of the noise, uh, Xi squared. And um, this is, um, so if the noise, if the noise wasn't there, once you know X, you know Y as a delta function. You know the Y value exactly. But because um, of the noise, this is one of the useful tricks for a theorist. So instead of writing P of Y over X, I'm in effect writing the probability distribution for Xi. xi. So um, this is equal to one over two pi and the variance of the noise, and then exponent the difference between y and g of x uh, over the two sigma of that variance. Any questions about this? Is it clear? Yeah, okay. Oh. Just to be sure, it's g a function of x or just g times x? No, here it's uh, g times x because we are discussing the linear case. Okay, so from here you can um, um, generalize in multiple directions. So, and today we will take just one direction, but in principle, g can be um, uh, g can be a function of x. And also X, um, it's, a, it's an approximation to say that it's one dimensional. So you can also have X vector. So then um, this becomes a matrix and we can talk about the optimal filtering properties of this matrix. Even when it is a linear function, um, then what is the optimal properties of this filtering matrix? And in addition, you can have many neurons and they talk to, and they encode the same X. So how should their nonlinearity be coordinated and how their mixing or filtering matrices should be coordinated. So, uh, so far in the first part of this lecture, we discussed optimal nonlinearity G of X. Now I am, um, just analyzing the linear case because it's um, kind of a, a tool using which we will uh, apply it in um, uh, other cases. Then later on in this lecture, if um, I'm planning to talk about nonlinearity but multiple neurons, but still a one dimensional X, and then next lectures will be X will be multi dimensional. And first uh, you have a single neuron and then you have multiple neurons. So this is a starting point from which you can um, analyze more complicated questions. G can be nonlinear, X can be multidimensional, and then Y can be multidimensional. Is that okay? How are we doing? Any more questions? Okay. So um, now that um, um, by definition, because this is noise and it has, um, by its definition, it has zero mean. Otherwise, we will just say that there is a constant offset and, and put it into Y. So then the simplification, which is actually not quite true for natural signals, is uh, to say that the signal itself, X, is also Gaussian. Then you write P of X in, in this form. And now we can put um, two things together to evaluate the noise entropy. So if you have an input Gaussian signal and I transformed it through a linear transformation, 
So it turns out that the result is also Gaussian. It's an interesting uh, thing that if you think of a covariance matrix represented by the ellipsoid of the covariance, if you cut it at different angles to take different projections, you will always have another ellipsoid. So that's a useful um, fact to keep in mind that when uh, we have a Gaussian signal, you apply a linear transformation, you will get a Gaussian signal at the end. But I will have a question for you here. Even for one dimensional signal, so I have a Gaussian distribution for X. And now I do not have a linear function, but I have a simple threshold function for G. So if it is positive, Y is equal to X. If it is negative, Y is equal to zero. Will I have a Gaussian distribution for my response signals? Any guess? Hello? So if the if if the G is like this, just a step function, what is the distribution of uh, of Y? So yes, B model, yes. It will only have values close to zero or close to one or close to the maximum, right? It's okay, Tanya? Yes, yes. So you will not have, um, um, but even in another case, what I was thinking that by model, but uh, I was thinking more of a case where it's like a threshold linear function. Um, oh, oh, okay. So a G, which is uh, like, like this and like this. Yes. Okay, so then uh, what would be the distribution of Y? If you have a distribution of X, which is something like this. Yes, so, yeah, what, what do people think? So then uh, but, for all values of x uh, smaller than this, uh, you will have zero, right? So there is a delta at zero. And then for all values of x which are larger than this, the distribution will be what? No? So if I plot here the distribution, there will be like a peak here at zero. And then the distribution for positive values will be what? What shape would it have? So imagine that I take this uh, to very negative values. What the distribution would be? Hello. Huh? Yeah. Gaussian, yes, yes. So here it is a truncated Gaussian, okay? So it will be like, like a Gaussian up to this point. Okay. Right, uh, Tanya? Yes. Thank you. So in particular, if you put the threshold in the middle of the distribution, you will have half of the Gaussian. Mm -hmm. And uh, then your distribution of the output signals will be, I would say, strongly non-Gaussian, right? You only have half of a Gaussian. And uh, so there are papers there's a, where they would say, okay, we have... Um, you know, there's a strong 
pull or temptation to, you know, just like in our case, say my, because we know the Gaussian case and we have a solution. So there are, there are several papers where you say, okay, the signal of input is Gaussian. The signal on your response is, is uh, also not Gaussian, but we approximate it as a Gaussian. And you will know that um, that's depending on where the threshold is, this may be not a good approximation because if it is on the tail, then yes, it's approximately Gaussian, but if it is in the middle of the distribution, then it will not be uh, a good approximation. So that depends on where the threshold of the neuron falls, if we have a threshold linear neuron. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So we can uh, move forward. So in our linear case, the output is also Gaussian. So now we just, because it's Gaussian, we don't know, um, we can write it in this form. We know the form, but we don't know the variance just yet. So does the response have a zero mean? Yes, uh, because if the X has a zero mean and the noise have a zero mean, then Y will have a zero mean. And therefore here we do not have anything. Um, there is no average Y. So, but the variance of the signal, I wrote it in a schematic form because we know it's a Gaussian, it has to have this form, but we can compute it. And it's the average of G squared X squared plus the variance of the noise. So in other words, it is a very, you know, what is, what I like about this example is that we went from, because we know the general expression of the Gaussian probability distribution, we never actually had to take this integral. So I could have said, in order to get P of Y, I will take this P of Y given X, this complicated expression, then multiply it by P of X, integrate over the X, I have to use a, settle point approximation method and arrive at P of Y. But we have omitted all these calculations because we know the form of a Gaussian variable that it needs to have and we just compute the relevant parameters. So that's when you write your own derivations, I think that's a useful uh, trick to know. So here, um, we know that the, what, we, what should be here in the denominator is the variance of the signal. So it's G squared X squared plus the variance of the noise. So the overall information is the, um, this joint integral over dx and dy, P of X and Y log two P of X and Y over these probability distributions, P of X and P of Y. So now we have um, expression for P of X, we have expression for P of Y, and P of X and Y, we will write it as a product of P of X and P of Y given X. And we have um, all the information, um, all the probability distributions where it is Christ. So we will write this instead of log two, you write it as nature logs to help us out because we have exp um, exponentials here and um, P of Y stays and P of X uh, divides this probability to make it conditional. And we have expressions for this probability distribution because it's a function of the noise. And we have expression for this probability distribution, which is here. So yes, that, that's what I said. So now this is our expression that we want to evaluate. And as a reminder, this is P of Y given X is um, the, has the Gaussian form and depends on the variance of the noise because that's the only deviation between Y and G of X. And uh, <laughs> P of Y has the Gaussian form with the variance Y squared. 
So in putting these things together, so what we need is the ratio of these two probability distributions under the logarithm. So first we will have the ratio of the prefactors. And this is, this is this term here. Because it's a constant, um, when we average over P of X and Y, it, it, it just a constant. So it doesn't, well, I guess we have an average here still, but it will be a constant. And then here we have logarithm of uh, conditional probability distribution. So that's the argument of its exponent. Plus, because uh, from P of Y, which is in the denominator, you get um, the other one. And we start to average over P of X and Y. So when we average this, this is a constant. This thing, the last term, when we take the average, they cancel out. Um, should be maybe two pi. Uh, there is no pi. Yes, pi is missing. And uh, here we have this, uh, <clears throat> but I think they will also cancel. Yeah. And uh, because the variance of uh, this thing is a variance of the noise, so then these, uh, the, the, the missing pies will, will cancel. And uh, so we have a very interesting expression, which is useful to remember that uh, we convert it back to base log two because we are working with this. And then the square root gave it one half over here. And here you have the ratio of the output to variance to the input variance. So, or in other words, because the y squared has the noise in it, it's one plus the variance in the signal times this uh, scaling factor over variance of the noise. So this part here is the signal to noise ratio. And, um, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about this expression. Um, first of all, suppose that the G is zero. So the, the output is zero. So then the information is a uh, log of one will be zero. And then you have um, uh, the variance of, and then it goes one plus X, where X is the signal to noise ratio between um, um, the, the signal over in the effective units of the noise. Any questions so far? Okay. No, I think it's okay. So sometimes it's useful to rewrite this in terms of effective noise. So not noise is additive, but because it's a linear system, we can kind of propagate it all the way to the input. Even though the input technically is assumed not to have noise, we will say, what is the effective noise that we have to add to the input in order to have the same noise at the output as we had before? So we just scale this input psi by G to put it here. And so then it should be that um, it should be x squared over the effective noise. Okay. So in other words, this is a difference between two Gaussian variables. And I apologize for my typos here. Uh, between the output of the noise, uh, the entropy of the output, which is this, this part right here. Y squared is um, Z squared plus G squared over X squared minus the entropy of the noise, which is this denominator here. Okay. And um, why this expression is so useful in the various parts of the engineering, for example, Imagine, because we said that um, 
the information from independent measurements as. So imagine that you have um, a transmitter that works across multiple frequencies. So X can refer to a specific frequency. And then um, there is a gain at each frequency. Now, if, if you have multiple frequencies, then you will have the same expression, but we will just integrate it over frequencies. So that's advantage of the Gaussian approximation. And uh, that the, the, what this expression will hold actually for multi-dimensional variables as long as they are independent. And uh, so now we can uh, go back to this case with um, hunchback um, um, transcription factor. So this is uh, um, the work by Bill Bialik and his experimental colleagues. And we have the expression for the, um, the variance here for, varian, um, for various measurement. And assuming that P of X is uniform, he computed information and um, it turns out that in this case, this uh, expression level of this hunchback gene um, gives you two uh, bits of information. And that is important or is interesting because it's greater than one. So let me give you a little bit of context for, um, for this gene. This is for a development of the fruit fry, a fruit fly embryo. And mother is depositing, I think this gene, in one side of um, an egg, and then it um, diffuses to the other end. And then other molecules come back and they convert this into um, that is, she deposits a different gene, bicoid, and then this, um, this is the, this gene, Hunchback takes the bicoid as input and, um, and, and picks at different levels. So uh, it's often thought of as an on and off gene. So people will say that the kind of common belief is that because it's an on and off channel, it will convey one bit of information. But when you do the analysis, uh, the variability is such that it is approximately twice more than um, uh, predicted by this classic on off model for this gene. So it means that all of these uh, variations in, um, in the in, in the values of uh, this nonlinearity, they matter for information transmission, and we can't quite approximate this as a constant here, transition, and a constant there. So that's an example application of this information analysis. Any questions? Any question? So in this case, uh, I guess the function G is nonlinear, right? Yes. So he does it for various axes independently um, mm -hmm. and then integrates over X, assuming it is a uniform distribution. Mm -hmm. um, the statement is approximately true, but you know, I would say that maybe the curvature of the embryo also ma makes um, makes a difference, but that's um, you know that's an approximation. And because it's a Gaussian approximation um, for the noise, that means that the information, the true information, can be larger because the noise entropy is. Um, in the Gaussian case is maxim in the maximal compared to other probability distributions. Okay. So now um, if uh, we are ready, I wanted to talk about uh, 
results now for multiple neurons. We are still talking about a one-dimensional signal and how to coordinate thresholds between two neurons. So imagine that you have an analog signal as shown here as a function of time and I cut it at certain level and I have a simplified nonlinearity. I have a choice between adjusting the threshold and potentially my noise level is set by metabolic cost. So in this case, because it is a binary device, we, I will not have full information about the underlying analog signal. But I, I will have some information. I will be able, for example, to say whether it is greater or less than the mean. And uh, so in this case, this is just a cartoon. This is showing how these um, information signals are encoded in this model into spike sections. If, it is if the signal is greater than the threshold, it is one. And if it is less than threshold, it is zero. So then we evaluate the information um, according to our equations, which is entropy minus um, the noise entropy. And now we have two neurons. So um, instead of two neurons, you have um, Actually, if that's okay, maybe I will switch to PowerPoint. Maybe it will be better. Because I think it's... Um... Yes, can we will? A bit more uh, we have a question uh, in the meantime from Carlos. Hi. Uh, in absence of a signal, uh, usually the, the neurons behave uh, with noise, uh, with Gaussian noise, I mean, or how you know that if experimentally if there is actually a signal? So, um, I guess one could, um, re maybe, uh, maybe the question, the way I understood the question, is if you keep the signal constant and I look at the variability in the neural response, will it be Gaussian? Is that, um, yeah. is that the question? So, <clears throat> um, if um, the neuron can only, if we are looking at small time intervals where the neuron produces at most one spike, then the probability distribution is um, typically bi binomial, um, binary or binomial. If we are looking at more t uh, broader time windows where it can produce the larger number of uh, responses, so maybe now actually the integer numbers, then a common model for neuronal noise is the Poisson distribution. But, and there the variance is equal to the mean. But um, some neurons are sub Poisson, meaning their variability is less than what would be predicted by a Poisson model. And in some neurons, the variability is super Poisson, is greater than would be predicted 
by the Poisson distribution. The reason for these differences are that typically the neuron itself, if it is a healthy neuron, will be fairly reliable. But what we are talking um, often when they talk about neuronal noise, they talk about a cumulative effect of all variables, except for the variable that we are controlling. So if uh, we are recording it for one neuron and we see that its responses go up and down when we fix the stimulus, it could be noise within a neuron, but it could also be noise from other parts of the brain that provide extra input to that neuron. So often this is how you get a super Poisson um, variability because you will have a some modulating factor uh, with which the variance goes up and down. For example, with attention, um, how tired somebody is, and uh, what, what they're thinking else, whether um, you know, they're distracted or not, or paying attention to this particular stimulus, this will, um, these modulatory signals they provide an additional source of noise. And so the variability is observed to be super Poisson. And uh, this um, modulating factor um, is usually stronger the deeper you go into the brain. So in the retina, it will be very reliable. And uh, the, the kind of the deeper we go inside the brain, the more of these external, in other words, we are further from the input. So the neurons themselves are still reliable, but they get many other signals in addition to the input that we are providing. Is that okay? Okay. Um, did we... Okay, so I don't hear anything, but um, it's okay. Okay, thank you, Colin. All right, so then um, in this case, so we um, we have uh, signal X of T. We have the response R of T. When you have multiple trials, and um, because of this, in, there are cases where neuronal produced a spike and on one trial, but not the other. So we have variable responses. And our information is a difference between two entropies, H of P of R minus the entropy for a given X times P of X. So that's the model that we have been describing for one neuron. So now we have two neurons. And with two neurons, the information, uh, the, the problem becomes um, much more interesting. So, and I will show you the, the main result uh, in, a few, in a few moments. And then maybe next lecture, we will go over the details and the implications of these results. So, um, now with two neurons, I have four parameters. Even if they are, I think we have a question in the chat. Okay, no, okay. So for each neuron, assume that it is a sigmoidal nonlinearity. And um, there are actually reasons for why to assume it's a sigmoidal nonlinearity. Um, we have mu one and nu one. Mu, one, mu is the threshold, nu is, um, the width of this fluctuating threshold. So by, by the way, if um, um, maybe it's a question for the students, Mateo, maybe would you mind writing or maybe, they, maybe one of the students can draw. If I give you the threshold mu and the noise um, new in the threshold, 
and um, it's a binary on-off neuron, what would be the nonlinearity for that neuron? Maybe that's a question for a student. Maybe somebody can go to the board and draw um, the nonlinearity. Should I start giving out the exam points, like plus one exam points? Sorry. Sorry. So you, the signal is this one, like uh, the one in the slide, and the, the output is uh, uh, one if uh, the signal is above the threshold, right? And zero yeah, if so it is below. Yeah, so let's not worry about the signal for now. We just plot a neuronal nonlinearity if it has a threshold mu oh. and variability in the threshold. So imagine that the signal X is affected by Gaussian noise and we have a binary neuron. So what will be the, non, how would nonlinearity look? How does it look? So I, I'm, I'm giving out plus one exam point. So how does it look like this function? Well, the Gaussian is the distribution of uh, of x, right? So this is the p of x. Yes, but you know, let's forget about x. Um, we just have a p of y given x, and um, um, I, I'm asking you have a threshold like device. So the first, the simpler question, p of y given x for a threshold with no noise. That 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 should be. Um, yeah. That should be okay. So one can draw is, that function. Uh, I think we discussed this uh, previously, right? So, I mean, in this case, if you have a simple threshold, how should this function g of x be? Yes, please. Jacopo? Like a step function. Okay, so it should be something like this and like this where this is the threshold mu right yeah and then the distribution of uh, of y over y should be what so for all these points here y should be equal to one and for all these points here, it should be equal to zero. So it's a B-model distribution. Right? Okay? Just two peaks. Is it okay, Tanya? Yes, it's okay. Now, if we have a little bit of noise that is um, added to the values of X, and, you know, we, we don't have... Um, just it can uh, somebody draw P of Y given X, um, now, nu is not zero, so... Um... So, you still have, uh, you, you still have this, uh, this model here? No, no, let's do a, a threshold, mu, like you draw, like a step function, but now um, y is equal to uh, theta of x, where theta is the heaviside function, but now x has some noise. Theta of x plus um, Okay, so y, theta. in this case, y is equal to theta of x minus mu, right? Yes. So and Now you want to put the noise inside the theta or outside? In, inside. Okay. So then the distribution of y remains just uh, b-modal, right? Well, it depends on the, how much noise I put in. Uh, but the values of y are only 0 and 1. So w uh -huh. whatever is inside, either you get 0 
or you get one. If you put the z outside, then uh, this thing becomes broader and this thing becomes broader, right? Yes, but um, I would like it to be inside and uh, not, not talk about p of y, but just draw y as a function of um, x. Ah, okay. So if you write, uh, say, say y is a function of x, then uh, yeah, you can take a value value zero or one, depending on whether the noise is uh, is such that. So if x is here, if I get the noise uh, which is negative enough. I can get zero. If I get a noise which is not so negative, I can get one. Right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, can, can uh, um, you know, just, can we just, uh, can somebody volunteer to draw P of Y given X in the presence of Zeta? Uh, I, I think it should still be two delta functions, no? Just one, uh, so P of Y given X should be just uh, two delta functions, so one in zero and one in one. And then the, how yes, but I'm, I'm hoping not P of Y, not the probability distribution, but just Y is a function of X. Ah, Y so is maybe, a function of X. Uh, yes, a, a simpler, a simpler. Um, so you want to compute, uh, maybe what you want to compute is the average of Y given X. Exactly, yes, okay. average of Y given X. So the average of y given x, so when, uh, if this is mu, it will be zero when x is very small, no? because then uh, this will be, uh, but then uh, uh, it will go up, and then it will be one, no? Yes, thank you. So this is average of y given x. Yes. So this new determines how sharp is this um, transition is. So if a uh, neuron experiences more noise, it will be kind of broader. And yeah. if a new is experiencing less noise, it will be sharper. Yes. So this will be with a lot of noise. Yes. And, uh, well, I don't have... Uh, what do you less noise, it will be closer to a delta function, right? Yes, thank you. Right, and so, um, now the question is, now I have a question. So a P of Y um, is still by model, it is still uh, two values because it's, um, well, I mean, by definition, it's a binary neuron. And the weights are, um, well, they will be determined by this probability distribution function, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so it, because it's a binary neuron, it is, we only have two values. So this and, will be uh, the probability that y is equal to 1 given x, right? Yes the probability that y is equal to 1 given x. So, yeah, so we have a bimodal distribution and this nonlinearity, on one hand, it is average y for a given x, but also a probability that y is equal to 1. 
And so the ratio between these two bimodal peaks. So um, I, I, I think I will, um, in the last, um, say, few minutes, four minutes, I will give you the result, and then we will kind of uh, decompose. So it will be kind of to be continued part. So the interesting part is that if you have two neurons, in each neuron has this nonlinearity, and we only say that the parameters that we can adjust for each neuron is its mean and uh, the, the noise. The noise is presumably fixed, but we will analyze solutions for different values of the noise. So, and we want to know what is the optimal value of um, thresholds. But it turns out that the average value of the thresholds of these two neurons is um, fixed by metabolic constraints. Because to a first approximation, the, the threshold, so if we think about one neuron, if it can, each spike costs a lot of energy. So um, the information increases the closer I place the threshold, the red or the blue line, to the middle of the distribution. If I place it exactly at the middle of the distribution, I will have uh, one bit of uh, one bit conveyed. But maybe because of the metabolic constraints, I can't just spike that much. So I will be uh, placed, my threshold will be placed somewhere on the outskirts of distribution as close as possible to the middle. So this is the solution for one neuron. Now for two neurons, if they have the same threshold, then um, their average threshold is still fixed by metabolic constraints and it will sit somewhere at some distance from the mean that is determined by how much on average both of them can spy. But when you have two neurons, you have a degree of freedom, which is the difference between their threshold, that is very weakly coupled to the changes in the overall spike rate. And that's an interesting, turns out to have an interesting parameter and has an interesting bifurcation. So I'll just tell you the result and then we will um, go over it in more detail next time. So in this graph, what is plotted is information that these two neurons convey as a function of threshold difference, mu1 minus mu2 for these two neurons, and for different scenarios of the noise, because we think that to reduce the noise, one has to make investments in metabolic uh, constraints, so different parts. So you see the surface information as a function of threshold difference in noise has a very interesting bifurcation. So, and um, it shows that when noise is large, it's optimal um, to have zero threshold difference between neurons. So I often say it's like you have a company, you have two new coming workers, you want to assign them the same task and average the results. And then as they get more competent, like neurons get more competent, you can partition the range of inputs to slightly different values and then um, interpret the result. And the bigger, the, stretch, uh, the less noisy they are, the more reliable they are, the bigger is the threshold difference between them. And so, um, so this is kind of the, the introduction to the next lecture. And um, we will talk about it. So as Mattia drawn for you, for one neuron, the distribution of signals is bimodal, zero or one. With two neurons, it has four possible values, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one. Turns out for this picture, the response entropy, uh, the noise entropy doesn't matter. So the main impact of these differences in the threshold is on the balance of these um, uh, little um, um, 
bars that describe this mm -hmm. probability distribution, P of one and so on. So, and then this problem has um, bifurcation and we will discuss how this has implications for diversification in biological systems. Okay, so yeah. for now, yeah, questions here? Are there questions? Okay, so I think there are no questions. Okay. So, very good. So maybe we stop here and we resume on Monday. Tanya, is this okay? Yes, yes. So there is another question from Colin. Um, the main book for this part of the, the one that is coming or the one that was um, uh, on information um, for Gaussian channels today's. Mm. Okay, so the main book is um, uh, will be Bill Bialix and uh, for next lecture, it's mostly my paper. Okay, okay so you. maybe uh, one idea is that you can uh, add this information to the Slack channel so that okay. uh, people mm -hmm. can uh, access this uh, material. Okay, so thank you very much. Yep. Bye bye. Okay, have a nice weekend. So, have a nice weekend and see you on uh, Monday.